So good morning again, everyone. So I'm Audra Mitchell, and on behalf of the Massey Learning Institute, we welcome you to our webinar Wednesdays, where we all get an opportunity to level up. We want to take a moment to thank you for your feedback, your participation, and your support over the last two sessions, actually, that we've had, and we look forward to an ongoing partnership with you. So because some of you have inquired, we just wanted to let you know that whilst these webinars are just an hour, it's meant to support your learning and to be able to give you an insight into what you will experience in our more in-depth programs and workshops, which we guarantee is value for many. So as I prepare to hand you over to our presenter who has a very exciting presentation to share with us, we want to remind you that as is customary at the end of the presentation, we will have our Q&A session. And again, in order for you to help us, this is what we want to suggest. If someone has posted a question that reflects what you want to find out about, then you can click like. So then based on the number of responses to a particular question, we'll attempt to address those and as well as some of the other questions time permitting. So today we are excited to introduce our presenter, Mr. Tony Olton, Principal Consultant of the Potter Center Barbados. We have a little bit of his profile on the screen, but as you can see, he's a very experienced and extremely qualified facilitator. He will deliver our topic, Surfing the Waves of Change. So, Tony, we welcome you. On behalf of Massey Learning Institution and the Massey family, we welcome you today. Tony? Hi, good morning, Audra. Good morning, all. Good morning, Dawn, Rene, Susanna. I am really pleased by the opportunity to share with you this morning. So fasten your seatbelts and let's take off. Uh, this morning, we want to spend the time that we have with you to do a number of things. We want to be able to connect, allow you to connect and reflect on and share some of your feelings in this very disruptive time in our lives. Uh, we want to help you develop a framework for effectively navigating this said disruption. Uh, we've been on lockdown over the past six, seven weeks. We've been told when we can shop, what time we have to be home by. A very unusual experience for, for most of us. Um, some of us as parents, we've had to work from home. We've had to work from home whilst our children, our charges themselves are also uh, attempting to do some sort of school. So we have to, we've had to share um, our devices, etc a really disruptive time, but this, this time is going to pass. And so the question is, are we going to be, be, going to be prepared for the, the new normal? Clearly, life is not going to return to the way it was six months ago, a year ago. So how can we best prepare ourselves for the time uh, that is going to be after the passing of this of this pandemic? And I said, notice I didn't say COVID-19 because all the evidence suggests that COVID-19 as a virus as the disease is going to be with us for a little while until such time as they can find a, a vaccine. So let's go to the beach. Not, I don't know when last you've been to the beach. Uh, trust you can see my video. In preparing today's presentation, uh, and I'm always trying to find out how can I best communicate messages, how can I best facilitate learning, and I came across this video. It's a video of surfers. This is out in Hawaii. These waves are humongous. We're looking at 25, probably 30 foot waves. Waves that would cause trepidation for most of us if we were at the beach and saw them coming at us. Yet, these surfers, that is what they live for. They deliberately seek out waves of this size because that's how they get their mo mo mojos, as they say. So regardless of what the wave is doing, these surfers are able, able to carve their way through the surf. That it doesn't matter what is going on around them, they're so focused that there's a knowing that they have, and there's a skill that they have that allows them to surf, to navigate these waves. And that is what this time is about. The framework for our engagement is emotional intelligence. Why emotional intelligence? because emotions drive people. Whatever experience you are having, how you respond to that experience is largely going to be a function of 
your emotions and your capacity to engage both your thinking function and your emotional function. And your ability to integrate, integrate those to what we call emotional intelligence. So that's going to be the framework for our time together. So the question is, in this time of high disruption, what have you been feeling? What feelings have you been having? To help you get there, there is a model known as the Plutchik Emotional Wheel. If you look on the screen, you'll see what looks like flowers, like petals of a flower. On the inside, you see joy, trust, and fear. Plutchik described those in his model as the eight basic or eight core emotions, that whatever emotion you are having, it is a, a, a variation, that is a degree of the emotion as listed, or a combination of those emotions. So you can have a combination, for example, of joy and trust, which would then manifest as love. So look at the list I have here, joy, trust, anticipation, fear, surprise, sadness, anger, and distrust. Which of those have you been feeling the most? Or which combination of those have you been feeling the most? Has it been joy? I ask that question because emotions are messages. Our emotions were designed for our survival. And so when you have an emotion, the emotion is either preparing you for a fight, for flight, or sometimes we just freeze. It's telling you something about yourself and it is preparing you for a response. What have you been feeling? Surprised? Have you been surprised? Uh, has there been sadness? Perhaps there's been the loss of a loved one or a close friend. Uh, perhaps you've been sad by the suffering. Uh, perhaps you've been made sad by the fact that, that that suffering is not just in terms of health, but a uh, person's been able to meet their needs, etc. Has it been anger? For example, have you been angry because uh, you see people who are disregarding the public health notices, the issues of dis social distance, wearing your mask, etc. Has that um, caused you some, some sense of anger? What about distrust? Uh, how trusting have you been of the messages coming from the official sources or from, in fact, um, the news and social media? Uh, what's been happening with you? At an emotional intelligence level, then, it is important for you to develop what we call emotional literacy. Because if you say emotional intelligence, if you can name your emotion, you can tame your emotion. So being able to identify what emotion you're having at any one point in time is also is, is very important. One of the things you've been heard, you've been taught virtually all your life, you've heard all of your life, is that change is constant. And that is true. Change is constant. It is ever present. Uh, if you reflect on your life experience over the last 10 years, you've evidenced any number of changes. You've changed jobs, you've gotten married, somebody's gotten, have you've had uh, babies. Those babies have been growing up. They've transitioned from nursery to primary, perhaps now in secondary schools. Um, so we, we've experienced constant changes in our lives. Some of us have been promoted, we've changed residence, um, we've changed our cars. And the truth is that in the absence of change, Life is pretty boring. Life gets dull, life gets stale. So that change, including the change that we're experiencing in today's circumstance, is just characteristic of life's journey. Change marks, notes, the evidence of life as we are experiencing it. But here's the other truth. How we respond to change is highly personal. Stephen Covey says, we all see the world not as it is. We see the world as we are. And when we respond, we respond based upon our own internal state. We, we respond based upon our own perspectives in life. So here are some truths. Change is constant. Change characterizes the nature of life's journey. And for each of us, change is extremely personal. So yes, you've heard that change is constant, that the only thing that remains constant, constant is change. I want to put a twist on that today for you in my effort to help you with the perspective that you need to have 
or a perspective that you should take on that will allow you to be effective in this time and past, past this time. And that is that what happens into you in life is a function of the thing that has happened and your response. That E plus R equals O, that the events that occur in your life plus your response is what produces the outcomes of your life. In other words, it is not so important what happens. What is more important is how you respond. And your response is going to be a function of your perspectives, your mindset, your maps, your paradigms, the models, the patterns that you use to be able to navigate life. Peter Drucker put it, this, put, put it this way. He says, the greatest danger in the times of turbulence is not the turbulence. It is to act with yesterday's logic, yesterday's habits, yesterday's patterns, yesterday's maps, yesterday's paradigms. Stephen Covey puts it this way. He says, nothing breeds failure like success. In other words, the thing that allowed you to be successful yesterday does not inherently guarantee success today if the dynamics of today's circumstance has changed. Nothing beats failure like success. So the FBI are responding to today's challenges based upon yesterday's, how we responded to yesterday's challenges and not yesterday, yesterday, but in the past, then chances are we are not going to be as successful as we would, would want to be. So let's change that perspective. Here's the one that I'm offering. The first is that change is not the only constant in our lives. You've heard that all of your life. It is not true. Here are the other four constants in our lives. In every single moment of our lives, we are faced with an opposite. Good and bad, right and wrong, left or right, up or down. Do I tell the truth or do I tell a lie? Do I perform with excellence or do I perform with callousness? In every moment of my life, I am faced with some sense of opposite in my life. Always, constantly, perpetually. Because life is about opposites, then we find ourselves in a place where we're always forced or be always being called on to make choices. Here's what scripture says. It says, no man can serve two masters. He will love one or, uh, and hate the other. It talks about a road called narrow and a road called wide. That is the nature of life. And so we have to decide which road we're going to take. We have to decide which master we're going to serve. Are we going to serve fear? Or are we going to serve love? We have to make those choices. But it also says that you reap what you sow. That we don't control the choice. We don't, while we control our choices, we don't control the consequences of our choices. And the consequences of our lives, of our choices, are already predetermined, are already set up. They're set up or determined by a set of universal principles that govern life. I said earlier, you can only reap what you sow. In other words, E plus R equals the O. So that whatever you put out, however you respond, it is, the game of life is already set up so that what is going to come back at you, the results of your response, the results of your choices, your decisions, your actions, they will come back to you in like measure. That none of us can sow corn and reap tomatoes. None of us can sow tomatoes and reap corn. And what that means is then that I have to be very careful in my choice making. Not that I'm ignorant of or I don't pay attention to what is happening. In fact, I have to pay attention to what is happening, but I must create pause. I must create that capacity to step back and ask the question, 
what are my choices? In other words, we have to become very intentional in our lives that this choice making is about being intentional, engaging in consequential thinking. The question is, what choices are you going to make? What choices in your life are you going to make? We say, when you can't go outside, go inside. Connect with your feelings. What are your feelings telling you? Do you recognize them? What are they telling you? And what do you want? What is it that you want? Regardless of what is happening around you, the disruption, however that is evidence. What is it that you want? What is it that you want in this moment for yourself as an individual, for yourself and your family, however again that is constructed, for yourself and your community, for yourself and your organization, for yourself and your nation, what is it that I want? And what choices must I make? So that regardless of what is happening around me, I can respond in ways that allow me to achieve what it is that I say that I want. What are your choices? Life is about opposite. Are the choices going to be one based upon pessimism? If your choices are based on pessimism, what it means is that in this moment, you're seeing the circumstances of your life. You're seeing the circumstances of this disruption as permanent. That this is it, will never change. You're seeing them as pervasive. You're seeing them as characterizing the sum of your life. Defining me. And you're seeing yourself as powerless. You're telling yourself there is nothing I can do in this moment. I'm a victim. Somebody else has to solve this problem or these problems. That is that is the perspective of pessimism. The opposite of pessimism is optimism. If I take on the perspective of optimism, remember. It is not so important what happens. It is more important how you respond. Your response is a function of your perspective. If I take on the perspective of optimism, I tell myself, yes, this disruption is highly disruptive. It is, wow, overwhelming. It is frightening. It makes me sad. It makes me angry. But this too shall pass. It is temporary. If I am viewing this through the lens or the perspective of, of optimism, I am telling myself this is a bleep in my journey through life. It does not define the sum of my life. It is an isolated moment in my life. It is an isolated moment in my life. And if I'm seeing it from the perspective of optimism, I'm also telling myself there's something I can do. Not necessarily that I know what I can do in this moment because it is highly disruptive. You know, my world has been turned upside down. Um, someone said to me the, the other day, we were going through this with another um, group of participants. Here's my challenge. Work was my escape from home. And home was my escape from work. What do I do? In this moment, I don't know what there is that I can do. It hasn't come to me as yet. But if I'm viewing life and if I'm viewing the circumstance from the perspective of optimism, then I, I, I am functioning from a place where I am telling myself there's an answer. The answer presently doesn't reside with me. It's going to take a little time to figure that out, but there is an answer. Perhaps I need to connect with others to find that answer, but there is an answer. Two completely different perspectives. The perspective of optimism says, ain't going to change. This is it. And I have no power. 
the perspective of optimism says time is passing. This too shall pass. It says this does not define me. It does not define the sum of my life. It is simply a moment in time, a bleak on the radar of my life. And there is something I can do. Effort is possible. The question then becomes, so where do I place that effort? How can, what is my most effective course of action in the circumstances in which I face myself? Again, I go back to Dr. Stephen Covey. Uh, his work, The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, I have found is a most powerful and profound work. In a very simplistic but profound way, he has captured the key elements, I believe, I have come to believe, for personal, interpersonal, and professional effectiveness. Notice he doesn't say success. The seven habits of highly effective people. One of the things he says in his work is, don't let the things you can do nothing about interfere with the things you can do a great deal about. Let me repeat that. That is sobering. That is liberating. That in the sum of our lives, there is a mass of issues that seek our time, our attention, our resources of, of time and money and energy. And, and, and they draw on us. They can almost sap all of that energy and resources and the resources that we have. He says, but within those that body of concerns that you have, within that body of concerns that you have, there are things that you can do something about. The trick, the trick is to turn your focus away from that cowering wave that is seemingly desirous of encompassing you. To take your eyes off that and to keep your eyes focused on the things that you have control over. If you think about it long enough, the things that you have control over have to do with you. The choices you make. Essentially three things. Choices around what to think. Choices around what to feel. And choices around what to do. If you can keep your focus on what goes on in your head, what you tell yourself, what we call your self-talk. If you can keep your focus on connecting with your feelings and deciding which feelings you're going to let go and which feelings you're going to hold on to. And if you can decide which actions are the actions that best get you the consequences that you want, notwithstanding what is happening to you, around you, even with you, that is where your power resides. Let me repeat third time. He says, don't let the things you can do nothing about interfere with the things that you can do a great deal about. So let's broaden the perspective. The perspective of you, we, we suggest, has four dimensions. There's you at the physical level. There's you at the mental level. There's you at the emotional, social level. And there's you at the spiritual level. Physical is your body. Physical is your health. Physical would be your physical resources. That would be your, your money, your, your, your property, anything that is physical, anything that you can touch, see, would be physical. Mental would have to do with the development of your mind, your consciousness. Emotional would be the relationship or is the relationship you have with yourself social, the relationship you have with others, 
as spiritual would be the relationship you have with that higher being, that higher power. Again, fourth thing, don't let the things you can do nothing about interfere, get in the way of the things that you can do a great deal about. So in this time of COVID-19, in this time of disruption, in this time where your world has been turned upside down, as it were, at the physical level, where do you choose to focus? What choices do you make about how you treat your body in this moment? Because that's in your control. What schedule do you have for maintaining exercise, whether that is three times a week, four times a week, 30 minutes a day? What time do you set aside every day to maintain this, this temple, this physical body? And in maintaining this physical body, what choices are you making about your diet? If you're working from home, do you pop to the fridge every five minutes because it's convenient? You can just, you know, hop there and get something to, to go by. So nutrition, your nutrition also becomes important in, in terms of your focus. Don't let the things you can do nothing about interfere with the things you can do a great deal about. I got up this morning and I, I have not yet turned on my television because I have made a decision about how much news and disinformation and misinformation I allow into my system. Not that I'm not going to watch the news, but sometimes during the day I'll take in 15 minutes and I will have to decipher and decode what is important and I'll have to shut it away. In other words, part of what is in my control is how much access to me do I give the stressors that otherwise going to pop up in or popping up in my life. At the mental level, again in my control, during this time, what do I do to develop my my, my consciousness? So what books am I reading? How much time do I spend looking into the future, contemplating uh, what the future is likely to be, visualizing, that is projecting into the future? Again, scripture puts it beautifully. It says, where there is no vision, that, that if we can't spend time in the present looking into the future, visualizing, the future and then making plans around that sense that we have of the future. Journaling is also important in this time. In other words, record your experiences so that when you've passed this, you can look back. They say life is best lived looking forward, but it is best understood looking back. So one of the things we advise in this time is journal the experience of this time. Journal your thoughts, journal your feelings, journal your actions, journal the things that have happened around you how you responded because that journaling will tell a story that when you look back at it can allow you know to be a little more effective and to be wiser going forward there are any number of online courses such as this webinars etc consciously and deliberately carry out time where you seek to expand your understanding of life your understanding of the world that you're engaging so participate in as many online courses as you, as you can and what do you need to do in the meantime to develop your skills, to expand your skill base? Because the world is changing. Change is constant. So unhook yourself from the way things used to be and prepare for yourself for the way things are going to be. So that's constantly expanding your knowledge and working on developing, developing your skills. At the emotional and social level, get out of your own head and get out of your own way. Spend some time thinking about, and more than thinking about, engaging in serving others. There's a power when you leave, when you take your focus off yourself and now turn your focus on how can I help? How can I make a difference in somebody else's life, in the, especially in this moment? And it doesn't have to be anything grand. Uh, some simple acts of kindness in this, in this time uh, will make significant difference in somebody else's life. And trust me, will make difference in your life as well. How can I demonstrate empathy uh, in my family, amongst my colleagues? It's a 30 minute, a 30 second call. I can, can drop someone in note, a WhatsApp, some message that demonstrates caring and concern for others. Um, how can I collaborate with others? That's the synergy. How can I collaborate with others to find solutions for the challenges that 
uh, exists in this time and space. And uh, what do I need to do? What can I do that allow me to maintain that sense of peace and balance in my life? And finally, at the spiritual level, spend some time in this time working on your sense of mission, vision, purpose, your values, recalibrating, defining who you are and what you want the rest of your life to be about. Guess what? Because this too shall pass. This too shall pass. And when this passes, who am I going to be? What is the wisdom I'm going to carry forward so that I can be a more effective person in my life? Spend time in prayer, reflection, spend time in meditation, spend time, um, and you don't have to go anywhere these days. In, in my collection, I have videos of Aquarius. I have videos of the forest. Um, so uh, there are any number of um, apps online where you can spend time in quiet meditation and reflection and get connected to nature. Um, where you spend time connecting with your higher power, taking care of your spiritual being. Sixth time, and I'm doing it for emphasis. Don't let the things you can do nothing about interfere with the things that you can do can do a great deal about. It says the goal isn't to get rid of all of your negative thoughts, your frustration, your sadness, your anger, your disappointment. It says the goal is to change how you respond to them. And how you respond to them is fundamentally going to be a function of what's going on in your head, how you think, how you feel, and how you manage yourself in ways that still allow you, notwithstanding what is going on around you, that still allow you to manifest the very best of yourself. Time is passing. Not everything is affected and there is something I can do. What do I do? I focus on my energy. I focus my energies on the things that I might control. What are those things? My thoughts, my feelings and my actions. And I spread those across the four dimensions of my life. The physical, the mental, the emotional, relationship with myself, social, how I engage others, and the spiritual, how I maintain that relationship with my higher power, with my creator, with God. Really, really grateful for the opportunity to share this time, and I'm really open to taking your, taking your questions. Great. Thank you, Tony. Thank so I now hand you over to, thank you. For really powerful insights, you know, unknown. I was just kind of, I mean, especially like when you said, but you, when you can't go outside, go inside. And I know yes. sometimes I, I, I try, well, I like that concept because I haven't really thought about that, you know. And so, so I guess before, I see we have a question there, but I just actually wanted to ask, you know, in a time like this when there's so much distractions, mm -hmm. you know, um, so persons who are working at home and, and, and home is now the office, you know, any tips in terms of the, how we can get that quiet space when it's not always, available for that sort of reflection? Uh, that, that quiet space, again, you have to be intentional. Uh, you know, I'm reminded of Christ in the boat and the storm raging and he's fast asleep. And the disciples, you know, do you, don't you care about us? Um, it, it, it's about getting that place where you are at peace on the inside of yourself. Uh, that a lot of the, a lot of the challenges we, we tend to have in life we have them because of our own internal disquiet. That if, if, you, if, you get, if you get to a place of peace in your life, how do you get there? Uh, it, you don't get there in one morning. There's no switch that you just turn on, except that you turn on the switch and you know become conscious and deliberate. That's what I mean by go inside. Um, it, you, you really create that pause where life is coming at you and you consciously and deliberately pause, stop, and ask yourself, well, first of all, tell yourself, what is it that I'm feeling? You know, I'm feeling X. I, I understand that. What is it that I want? 
and what is it that I need to do so that I get what I want. So it's, it's that ongoing mindfulness, being present, being in the moment. Uh, it's about recognizing that, not recognizing, it's about getting to a place where I am the performer, I am thinking, I am feeling, I am doing, and at the same time, I am the observer of myself. And that's the answer I want to leave with you. That I am having my being, I am thinking thoughts, I am having feelings, and I am likely to act or I am acting. All that is happening. Can I step outside of myself and observe myself? Can I think about my thoughts? Can I think about my feelings? Can I think about my actions all before I act? And therefore only act in ways that manifest my sense of myself and the outcomes that I say that I want in life. Okay, great. I, I trust Thank that helps. Yes, it does. Thank you so much. So I'm going to hand you over now to Renny. Hi, Sister we'll Renny. Good morning. Good morning, Tony. Good morning, everyone. So we have one question so far. Oh, and yeah. here it is. How do I get motivated and stay motivated? How do I get motivated and stay motivated? Um, optimism. That, that sense that this is not it. That as bad as this might be, there's something else. I have to find that something else. Two, I am responsible. You know, uh, <laughs> one of the things the coming out of the Berlin Wall, one of the quotations coming out of the Berlin, but before the Berlin Wall, and what led up to it, is a saying that says, "The Americans are not coming." Meaning that if you're going to be truly successful in your life, you have to get to a place where you take responsibility for the outcomes of your life. Uh, many of us are held back. All of us were created with tremendous gifts to fulfill our potential. But many of us are held back because we are waiting for somebody else to do something that will clear the path. We're waiting for somebody else to come with the solution. No. The way God created us is that he created us with purpose and he gave us the gifts to be able to fulfill that purpose in life. To get motivated then is to get connected to that sense of purpose in your life. Why am I here? What difference can I make in life? Part of getting motivated also means that we have to stop comparing ourselves to others. That's what the writer says that for all, they will always be greater and lesser persons. That when you compare yourself with others, you are always, not sometimes, not most times, that whenever you compare yourself with others, you are going to come up short. You will always be assured of some defect in your life. You have to get to a place where you are persuaded that I am adequate. I am adequate for the moment. I am up to the challenge. And if I'm not up to the challenge, if I'm adequate for the moment, what do I need to do so that I prepare myself so that I can be adequate for the moment? And that ties back to your question of taking personal responsibility for the outcomes of your life. Stop blaming, stop criticizing, stop comparing, stop competing. And in any one moment, figure out who am I? What is it that I am about? What is it that I want? And what is it that I can do? So to be able to achieve what I said that I want. Thank you. Thank you, Tony, for that response. I have a follow up to that one. Mm -hmm. so this person is saying. That seems to require practice. Being Absolutely. The external observer of yourself. Yes. Would you suggest a practice of meditation before heading out to the day or are there other tools I could use to settle myself? Yes. So the, 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 the person asking the question answered the question. <laughs> yes, create quiet time. I, I use the term being intentional. You, you really have to become extremely intentional 
where you tell yourself, this is what I want. And, and the, any number, any number of meditation tools uh, and online, both in term, both from um, the Apple platform as well as the Windows platform, any number of tools. Um, there's Audible that has a number of resources as well, where you can <clears throat> tap in and have that experience of, of meditation. It is, it is about prayer. Um, uh, it's reading material that allows you to take that energy in. Um, something motivational. Um, there are any number of meditation guide. Um, term slips me now. Um, guides that help you with your, your thoughts for the day. Those kind of things. But you, again, you have to be deliberate and intentional around those. Yes. And yes, it requires practice. It's like building muscle. Um, I know because I I've been writing for a while. Hadn't written for about a year. And then when I got back on my bike, I found that I could not function as I'd been functioning just at about the time because I, I had a fall and injured my, my left leg. It took me at least six months to get back to a place where I was before I had that injury because the muscles had begun to, to weaken. So I had to build those muscles back up. So take what we're discussing in the context or the, use the metaphor of muscle building that the muscles are there, but on the, until we work them, then they, they don't work for us. Thank you. Thank you, Tony. One other question we have. How do we influence others to change their behaviors and adapt to the new normal? Some people have not accepted that life has changed and it will be this way for a long time. Two things. One, be the model. Be the model. Um, that go inside again and manifest. You be the model. That, that's that's the best the best form of influence in other people's lives is our own personal modeling. Whether we be parent, whether we be supervisor, manager, teacher, friend, um, stop telling, start living. Stop telling. Once you get to that place of of Self-discipline, self-observation, self-discipline, self-regulation. Also stop telling and start asking. That's where empathy comes in. That is, um, you know, somebody says something that you know doesn't quite comport with the perspective that you have. Tell me more about that. Um, what makes you, what makes you see it that way? How else do you think you could have, you could see it? How else do you think you could do it? What are the options do you, that you, do you think that you can have? So if you, if you understand self-awareness, if you understand uh, choosing self, and if you understand giving self, then you can ask questions. You don't tell, but you ask questions that get people now to go inside themselves, begin to think. Because we, we are creatures of habit, we are creatures of patterns, maps that we use constantly. We don't question our maps. So if I'm going to help you, I don't help you by telling you, man, you should do this more. And if that was me, that language should not be part of your vocabulary. And so Rene, uh, I heard you say yesterday X, Y, and Z. Um, what makes you say that? Um, no, you have to think. No, you have to think. And when you tell me, and when you give me your answer, then the next question pops up. Um, okay, okay, okay. Um, what if? Yeah, and, and that what if question now gets you to go inside yourself even more. And uh, OK, then you have to do some. You have to do that questioning. You have to question the maps that you're using, the perspectives that you are bringing to bear. So my answer in short is be the model and be the coach. A, a strong coaching is not about telling. Strong coaching is about asking questions so that people discover their answers for themselves. Thank and you, that thank you. And, that, and that, include, that includes your children. All right, I have one more for you. Sure. How can you truly let go and not be bothered by what you can't control because it's, it's hard not to worry? Yes. So I'm going to take you back to the Stephen Covey model. One of the things he says in that model is, when you start out, your circle of influence, those things that you control can control is a very small circle. 
But he says, the more you focus on the things that are in your control, that circle of influence will expand. So you have to be patient, and it does take time, yes. But the more you focus on the things that are in your control, over time, eventually, more and more of the things that are outside of your control today become things that are within your control. My, 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 the corollary to that answer is the value of prayer. Uh, my perspective on prayer says, I pray about those things. I pray and release those things that I can do nothing about. And when I get off my knees or my bed or wherever I have my prayer, then I go to work on the things that are in my control. Let me, let me, give, you, let me give you an example. Uh, I've often said to people that the way we pray is like flying a kite. So the kite is in the air, we have the string. And, but, so we're still holding on to the string because we want to solve the problem ourselves. If I pray about a matter that is outside of my control, the thing I have to do is to let it go. Let it go. And go to work on the things that are in my control. And that's, that's where you find that sense of peace. You know, scripture says that all things, not some, not most, all things work together for the good of those who love the Lord and who are called according to his purpose. And I, I translate that to mean once you are living based upon principles, because principles are universal, principles were designed and instilled and installed by God. So that once you once you are living based upon principles, you can be at peace. Because what principles do, principles provide predetermined outcomes. In other words, I know what is going to happen before it happens. I don't know when, I don't know how, but I know that if I treat others with respect, it is only a matter of time before I earn the respect of others. I know that if I tell the truth, as painful as it might be in the moment, I know if I tell the truth, there's a reward that comes with that. Um, and I, and I use those two examples of how do we function at a place where we take responsibility, where we take control of the things that we have control over and let go of the rest. You can let go of the rest if what you have done is based upon some universal truth, some universal principle that God has put in place. Thank you. I hope the person was able to get your answer. Thank you, sure. thank you so much for that. Here's another one we have. We have four persons liking this one. Mm -hmm. How can you minimize emotional burnout during this time? Having to juggle working from home, tending to kids and managing a household. That would be our webinar. Uh, working remotely, finding <laughs> balance, delivering results. It's about establishing priorities and uh, developing a work plan around those priorities. <clears throat> but there, there'll be some underlying, some underpinning awareness that you would need to have to be able to benefit from that. But yes, um, th it is possible, uh, but it, it has, you, have the very, you have to have a very clear sense of who you are, of what is it you're about. You must move to a place in your life where you take personal responsibility. And you must also have, a, you almost, must also be at a place in your life where you have a sense of your own priorities, what is it, what is what is important, and then mapping that out in the in the course of your week, so that you are able to achieve week by week all the goals you set for yourself in your personal life, and in your and in your work life. And that again would be across the four dimensions: physical, mental, emotional, social, spiritual. Yes, agreed. I think we have time for another one. Let's go with this one. How do you break the pattern of procrastination and force yourself to take action once you have made a decision on something you want to change or do? So be, have a very clear sense of what it is that you want. And again, discipline yourself. Baby steps, baby steps, baby steps. Um, nobody gets all their stuff right. Uh, when you step out, sometimes you're going to get it done right. Sometimes you're going to mess up. That's okay. Here's what we teach. Sometimes you win. Sometimes you learn. 
That is, sometimes when you step out, you take some little action, you get the result that you want. Sometimes you step out, you take an action, it doesn't quite produce the result that you want. You step back, you evaluate, you ask yourself, okay, so what, did they, what was I thinking at the time? Uh, what was my body of knowledge? What additional information do I need? And then having got uh, that, that additional information, however that is acquired, then what is the next decision I need to make? So you keep moving. You, you, you don't punish yourself because it didn't work out the way you anticipated. <clears throat> if something doesn't work, that's fine. What did I learn? Then what's the new decision I need to make going forward? So it's called failing forward. That, that's, the, that's the term that they use these days. You fail forward because you're constantly learning and constantly growing. This I'm next very, I'm question, sorry, sorry, before, sorry. Before, you go, before you go right here, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm, I'm bearing in mind that they say action is the antidote to fear. That mm -hmm. a lot of what holds us back, a lot of what drives procrastination is fear. Because we don't have all the answers. We don't think we have all the resources and blah, blah, blah. You act with what you know, you act with what you have. As you get more awareness, more resources, more whatever, then you make a new decision, but you keep acting. Acting is the antidote to fear. Fear is the driver of procrastination. Acting is the antidote to fear. I like, I like that one, I like that one. And I think that ties into the next question that I was gonna ask for this person. How do we get motivated and stay motivated? Well, I think we dealt with that one before. Yeah. Um, you want to get to a place in your life where you have determined what you want the rest of your life to be about. Uh, too many of us uh, just try to get through the day. Uh, and that is a source of much frustration. I say come up higher. Get the big picture of the life that you want to live. The life that you want to experience, get that big picture. And then set about a plan over time to be able to realize that that picture that you have of yourself. Again, it says where there is no vision, people perish. The translation I like says where there is no joyful expectation of the future. Uh, Jim Rohn, one of my favorite philosophers, he puts it this way. He says, a compelling way will overcome any disruptive what? What that means is, if my sense of the future is so compelling, when life presents and it is disruptive, it, it, it seems to throw me off my tracks. The degree to which I'm able to bounce back, get up go again will be determined by how compelling that vision I have of myself. So here's the example I'm going to I'm going to bring. If, if we left, uh, and I know some of our, our practices this morning in Trinidad. So let's, I'm, I'm going to use the Trinidad example. So if I left um, Port of Spain, headed for where am I headed? Give me somebody in Trinidad, in Trinidad. give me an example of some location in Trinidad. Point 14. Mm -hmm. ah, there you go. There you go. So if I if I leave um, Hilton and I'm going to point 14, that's my destination. Halfway between Hilton and point 14, there's an accident. There's a major accident. What do I do? For human beings being what we are, we may you know, hang for a while and see what's happening. If it's a family member and just friends and what's we can help, blah, blah, blah. But the moment we decide that, you know, we, we, are no, we are no good here, there's nothing that we can do in this moment, what do we do? We, we get back into our vehicle and we find an alternate route. Why? Because there's something in point 40 that is compelling our being there. So we, we have not allowed the accident to derail us from achieving our objective. We've been able to keep our focus, change, change our route, we didn't change our destination, we changed our route simply because we knew where we wanted to be and we knew where we wanted to be there.
All right. I have time for just one more. Let me just ask this last one. This one is a comment and a question mm -hmm. from Donna. Just want to say it's very informative. How can we continue to stay positive and focused in what most people see as such a negative impact on the world? By human nature, we, we put a limit to staying positive. How can we mm -hmm. manage staying positive and how long? How, how do you eat an elephant? <laughs> How do you eat an elephant? One piece at a time. One piece Not at a time. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> don't, don't bite off any more that you and you can chew. You know, um, you know, the, the disciples says, Master, teach us how to pray. And part of that prayer says, give us this day our daily bread. In other words, get through this moment and the next moment and the next moment in every moment you simply do your best your best will change from time to time but always do your best now that sounds like a paradox always do your best in any one moment of your life whatever the circumstance try to figure out and do what is my best? What is the best that I can do in this moment, given my circumstance? I begin knowing <clears throat> that my best will change from time to time. But whatever leaves me is my best. If, if we focus on this moment and what is the best I can do in this moment, you do that and then move to the next moment, whatever that is, and you begin to process all over again. What is this moment asking of me? And what is the best that I can do? And you do your best. And then you move to the next moment. And the next moment, just within that process. Give us this day our daily bread. You didn't ask for bread for the year, just for the day. Wow. Thank you, Rennie, and thank you, Tony. I mean, there were so many powerful nuggets. I was busy taking notes. You know, and the last thing that you said, right? My best will change from time to time. But whatever leads me is my best. Yeah. Tony, on behalf of the Massey Learning Institute and the Massey Group and all the participants and attendees today, I really want to thank you for, for such insightful sharing. I know I have a lot of reflection to go home and do, you know, because you <laughs> ask some powerful questions around choices. Mm -hmm. So I have some homework to do, but That's I really fine. want to thank you. And we look forward to having you, you know, um, as we said in the workshops and webinars, any longer sessions, yes. you know, yeah. helping us as we as we navigate, or as you said, as we surf the waves of change. Yeah. I think you have really equipped us with some very helpful tools and, and some, some thoughts and reflections to help us. So again, I want to thank you. And, and I, I want to thank, thank everybody for And I want to thank you for, for inviting me and giving me the opportunity to share with you and your team. Great, thank you. Thanks so everybody. Thank you. So we've come to the end and um, we look forward to seeing you at our other upcoming webinars. Everybody be safe, have a great day and stay blessed. Thanks. Bye bye.